The following program is brought to you by the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists and by Hope Channel in cooperation with this network. Thank you for joining us today for Revival and Reformation. This is a special Hope Channel series that we're preparing and sharing with you on the importance of a dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ where His Holy Spirit, where His life is renewed and revived in our hearts every day and how the Holy Spirit reforms us so that our lives are like Jesus Christ. So thank you for joining us today for Revival and Reformation. My guest today is Pastor C.D. Brooks. Pastor Brooks is a, a very well-known speaker here in North America and in many regions around the world. He is the founder of the Breath of Life Ministries. And Pastor Brooks, you were telling me a moment ago that you've spent more than 50 years in active ministry. That's a long time, Brad, and a great experience that God has given to me. Well, Pastor, I want to thank you for those years of ministry. And I want to say to our audience and to you, my friend, Pastor Brooks has been a huge personal inspiration for me. I've listened to many of his evangelistic sermons many times. You've shaped my thinking and my ministry. And I thank you, Pastor, for what you've, how God has used you for making an impact in my life. And I thank him. Yes. Now, Pastor, today's the topic is revival and reformation. Yes. Briefly. Why is revival, reformation so important? Why should people, <laughs> to met, met, let, let me be very, very pointed, why should they listen and apply the message that you're going to be sharing in a few minutes' time? I had the privilege of sitting on a board a little earlier, mm -hmm. and they gave to each of us a new book written by Ellen White, or it's a compilation, yes. and it's called True Revival, yes. The Church's Greatest Need. Okay. I believe exactly that. We are sort of coasting along now, and yet signs of the end are everywhere to be seen. The Holy Spirit is withdrawing from the earth. Satan is advancing. We are in the final days, mm -hmm. and what we need truly is revival. Now, revival is a change of mind. Reformation is a change of ways. Okay. The two work together. And then we added the idea of rain. <laughs> okay, well, now we're going to hear about that in just a moment. I don't, want, right. I don't want you to tell us all that we're going to be <laughs> hearing. So uh, the, the need of the time with the things in this world indicating the imminency of Jesus' second coming, we need to be ready. Yes. Friends, as Pastor Brooks uh, prepares to uh, share his message with us, I'd like to invite you to please bow your heads with me just now and let's pray that God will bless in a very special way as we prepare to listen to this message with Pastor Brooks. Heavenly Father, we love you. We want to be close to you. And today, uh, Pastor Brooks is going to be sharing this powerful message on revival, reformation, and reign. Please open our hearts and speak to us. Help us to understand how this practically applies to our life. And dear Father, I just want to pray in a special way for maybe a person who is watching today who is not a Christian, but who is considering to be a Christian and who is wondering how and why the whole message of the Bible applies to their lives today. I ask that you please bless those individuals in a very practical way and draw them closer to you. So bless us now as we come and listen to Pastor Brooks as he shares the Word of God with us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Many of you know that my blessed mother received a vision when I was six months old, and the Lord told her to keep the Sabbath. We had no books, no teachers, no directions, just mother, her vision, and her Bible. A decade later, I walked into the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a bright November morning, 1940. 
I remember how impressed I was. Oh, the building was not impressive. But there was a spirit there. And hanging above the pulpit, the fourth commandment. And something seemed to say to me, this is it. In 70 years that have followed, I have not changed my mind one iota. I was 10 years old that morning. The meetings that were going on were unusual. I had belonged to the Mount Carmel Methodist Church, and we had never seen visual aids used before in meetings. Somebody here might remember the old Prager slides, glass slides, uh, glorious color. There was a little story contained in those slides called The Game of Life. And it showed mortals playing a game with the devil, taking a chance with their souls. I focused on one, trying to match wits with an arch deceiver. The devil knows all the clever moves. He will move in worldliness and move out prayer. He will move in error and move out truth. The devil will move in immorality and move out virtue. He will move in division and move out unity. He will come in with hatred and move out love. And then he will bring doubt and destroy faith. And in those slides, the trap was sprung. He had another victim in his clutches. And these depicted in powerful color, failure that comes to those who toy around with the devil himself. The Lord is patiently dealing with us this church. Time itself is rushing toward a cataclysmic collision with eternity. The end is very near. There is this protracted delay. And it is so misunderstood by God's suffering children that many are crying out, Lord, how long? How long? There are clues all through the Word of God. One of them that I repeat in times of question, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, but not willing that any should perish. But the evidence of his soon appearing appears everywhere we look. We are in the final age we are there. No need to make a mistake about that. It's time for us to examine ourselves personally, individually, and stay on our knees until we see our desperate need of revival and reformation. A change of heart, a change of ways, and it also includes a change in appearance. I speak freely of final things because I am utterly convicted that we are there. I notice the capricious acts of nature, earthquakes in diverse places. There were years recently, if you heard of an earthquake, you wanted to know what part of California are you talking about? Today, you got to talk about Haiti and Chile and the biggest of all in China. Storms and fires and floods. Ellen White says, God is not seeking to destroy men in mass, but rather to wake us up. And if anybody needs to wake up, it's us. Amen. We need to wake up. Yes, the prophetic outcome is sure and certain. And God's people, by his decision, are part of this great, cosmic showdown. God has worked that out. That's his program. And alas, we are not ready. 
The devil himself is excited. Yes, he is. And he's excited because the Bible says he knows he has but a short time. Not only that, St. James says the devils believe. He reads the Bible and he believes. What's wrong with us? The great theme that has been chosen since Atlanta, revival and reformation, I believe to be inspired of God. Amen. I walk in here and see saints on their knees before the 8 o'clock service. If we want revival and reformation, we're already told by inspiration, these will come only in answer to prayer. Amen. Ask for rain. Ask for it. Don't just say, Lord, give it, but pray. And pray until it comes to you. Ask for rain. Reformation. I read this little line and put it on my paper. It is a correction of that which is faulty, defective, inefficient, and objectionable. When we talk about reformation, that's what we're talking about. One of the most powerful moments in world history came with the reformation in Europe way back long, long ago as the 1260-year prophecy was beginning to wind down. Finally, the Reformation turned the corner. One of the stars of the Reformation, as far as I'm concerned, was Prince Frederick, Duke of Saxony. And there were other princes in the empire who all of a sudden were believers. Charles V of Germany was breathing fire. He sent out threats and anathemas and they were slung around like lightning bolts all across the empire. Charles was a servant of Rome and ready to do business the way Rome did it. But he first wanted to terrorize. And Duke Frederick began to spread the word amongst the princes. We should arm ourselves and meet these folk on the bloody field of battle. And when that word reached Martin Luther, he made haste to get this message back to Duke Frederick of Saxony. Exhort the people to contend valiantly before the throne of God by faith and prayer. Amen. Our chief want, our chief labor is prayer. Amen. Our people are exposed to the edge of the sword, to the rage of Satan. Let them pray. From the secret place of prayer came the power that shook the world in the great reformation. And that's recorded in the great controversy. Leaders were exhorting the church then to prayer. Our leaders are doing it now. Revival and reformation. And the Lord's servant says the angels are amazed that we don't pray more. Since prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse. We don't pray more. And I'm talking about myself also. And we are told we've got to get to that if we want to see a difference. So I ask each of you to ponder, what does that word mean to you? I know what prayer has been responsible for. Prayer defeated crack troops of pagans from Egypt to the promised land. The deserts were strewn with their bleaching bones. Prayer air-conditioned a furnace in Babylon. Prayer took the appetite of lions in Persia. Prayer nauseated a whale and made him vomit up a man who was prone to against God's business. Yes. Luther wrote these words, inward penitence is nothing unless it produces various mortifications of the flesh. Those words were included with the 95 Theses nailed to the church door at Wittenberg. Now the spirit of prophecy says it's not enough to pray a few minutes a day like morning and noon and evening. That's, that's a good pattern, but that's not enough. 
She uses a word. We got to agonize. Amen. Now, I'm going to confess to you, I've been thinking about that and trying to, usually my prayer life has been thanking God for all his blessings, and that's good, and asking him to direct and to help, and that's good, asking him to save my children, and that's good. But he has spared me the kind of experience that called on me to agonize. And yet Jesus did that. The Bible says, with strong cries and tears, Christ prayed to his Father. The birds on their roosts couldn't rest. Nocturnal creatures must have heard it and wondered what's going on out here. The Lord of hosts was in prayer. That's what was going on. We face a crafty foe. And he delights when the spirit of prophecy is disparaged. The devil has emails and Facebooks and bloggers who are busied trying to discredit the spirit of prophecy, hurling their cyber maledictions at a resting prophet, a holy woman whom God chose even against her will to help his people and lead them to the establishment of this church. Humble, wonderful, God's prophetess. And there is a promise that he will use those writings to guide us through the time of trouble. He knows about it. He hates the spirit of prophecy. And if you listen to some of the people talk, you, you don't just get them objecting. They hate it. And they hate Ellen White. And they can't explain it. They just do. Well, I want to tell you this and tell myself this. If Satan succeeds in discrediting the spirit of prophecy in this church, anything goes. God will be misrepresented among his people and the world will not be impressed with us or anything else. And the devil will enjoy diminishing God's church through music, through philosophical irrationalities, through silly liturgies, through standards cast to the dust, through principles that are thrown down. Everything will be diminished and corrupted and perverted in some measure if the spirit of prophecy is successfully discredited. I don't know why it is we can't stand being peculiar. No, I like to define that word. It doesn't mean that you are weird. You don't have to be weird to be peculiar. All you have to do is go home to one wife and you're peculiar. <laughs> and, and the word peculiar means distinctive and distinguishable. That's a good word. Nothing to be ashamed of. And I don't know why we seem to dread being called peculiar. Now, Mark Twain said, it's not all of those things about the Bible that I don't understand which bother me. It's the things in the Bible that I do understand that bother me. In a special sense, we, our church, we are the delayers. Oh, yeah, Ellen White said before she died, Christ should have come ere this, meaning that date, had the church been faithful. We are the delayers. There's so much pride, so much arrogance, a tendency to contend. If, 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 if leaders say, go right, we got to go left. The Lord is not doing that. So much pride, so much arrogance. When there is need of humility and simplicity. I was reading John Milton. You know what he said? He spoke of the irresistible might of weakness. That's profound. 
a student called me long distance the other day. It happens be times. I don't know who he was. I don't think he knows me. But he called me long distance in my office. And he said, Pastor, we were sitting in class this morning, and we were told that we can take care of a lot of our sins, and then we need Jesus. And I thought to myself, parents and students are sacrificing to hear that in our classrooms, in our institutions. Now I've got to be so careful because you don't want to create a problem in relationships far away. But in my head, it thundered, that's wrong. Ellen White says, not one whit. She chooses some words that amuse me. In another place, she said, I wouldn't give a straw for all this philosophical hogwash. But here she says, not one whit of what a man does can bring him salvation. It's all done by Jesus. What do you mean you can handle part of it? All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. So the professor who said that, if he said it, was wrong. And someone might say to me, are you claiming to be smarter than our learned professor? My answer is it's not about that. It's about faith in what God has said. Amen. And I believe what God has said. Amen. All I got to do is know it. Amen. All I got to do is see it. And I don't know everything. And when I learn something new and I know God said it, I'm in the book on it. I believe it. The plan of redemption is not that complicated, folks. Now, I have no desire to disparage intellectual development. I believe in high scholarship. Now, maybe I invented this, but there's a little difference between scholarship and scholasticism. The latter one can become a god before whose altar we bow. And we get into trouble, but salvation is not that difficult to understand. And I'm always seeking more, more about Jesus. I make trips every now and then up to biblical research. Got some friends up there, and I have some points I need to be straightened out on. And they help me. So I believe in the development of the mind. As a matter of fact, Ellen White excoriates those who don't use their brains. She says we only use about 10% of the brain power. But after your brain is in gear, we got to have the discipline of faith and just shall live by faith. That's Old Testament theology. That's New Testament theology. That's the way it is. And the spirit of prophecy will guide us through to the time of trouble. But we've got to humble ourselves through repeated transgression, which in my book includes stubbornness and rebellion, rebelling against everything, if we keep that up, we'll come to the place where we cannot see. Those are inspired words. Jesus chose a special cadre of men to turn the world upside down. You ever look at the list? A few fishermen, a couple of hated publicans, and some other ordinary people, common laborers. And the intelligentsia of Israel took note. There was a power in what they were doing, and yet the great scholars got together and said, who are these fellows seeing they don't have letters? Well, I want you to know St. Paul had letters, and he discovered his thesis, the just shall live by faith, and wrote it down in the New Testament. Christ is soon to rise up to shake terribly the earth but he wants his chosen people ready. He wants them revived, and he wants them reformed. Let me restate it and become inclusive. He wants us revived. He wants us reformed. That is clear. And the spirit of prophecy says, when the image of Christ is perfectly reproduced in us, he's going to come. He knows when his work will be finished. We don't know. And why don't we like that? Why don't we accept that? Why not? What's wrong with that? Why is it resented? 
I ask myself sometimes, really, beloved, do we imagine that in the middle of the 19th century, God got it wrong? That he made a mistake? So now in these last days, which are already full of confusion, God is apologizing and appearing uncertain and slipshod? Can anybody possibly believe that? Anyone who rises up against the true prophet is a false prophet. And God does not commend that. I listen when he says in Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord, I change not. I listen when he says I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I believe what God says. I believe it when he says the three angels' messages are the last warning message to the world. And as a friend of mine would ask, what part of last is it? We don't understand. Is it the LA or the ST? <laughs> truth must be proclaimed and we must settle what is truth and settle ourselves into it. Revelation 12, 17 stands as a pillar. It's not going to change. It cannot be moved. God has set his love on what he calls the remnant church. They are the special objects of his grace. Now, I didn't say they are the only ones who are going to be saved. As a matter of fact, Ellen White says the majority of his people are still in other communions. That's what revival and reformation is about. God will then give us power to get them out, the called out ones. They'll be one fold and one shepherd. And so this is our work in a special way. We are to be his models, his witnesses. And the Reformation will make us peculiar. Even the name Seventh-day Adventist is a standing rebuke to the Protestant world, says the spirit of prophecy. So his call to revival and reformation amongst our leadership is inspired, I believe, with all my heart. Now, I tell you something. I am no friend to fanatics. I'm not fanatical about anything. Uh, you know, a, a fanaticism, I was reading this, grew up in 1916. They were called the Reformed Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, a fanatical group. Two years later, they had to be disfellowshipped, all of them. And they prophesied that Christ would come in February, February 6, 1925. He didn't come. False prophets. And yet God is saying to you and to me, when you search for truth, go back and seek the old paths. Old. And that word bothers us. You see, we are modern. We are uh, full of technology and everything else wonderful. And to say old suggests... Uh, even when you get old. My son stood up in a packed church and announced that that day was my birthday and I was 80 years old. It struck me. I could hardly believe it. <laughs> but I'm thankful to be here. Ask for the old path. And we are bothered by that word old. Well, let me tell you something. The Bible tells us that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. And if that be true, then going back to the last century in search of our foundation and our roots is just a few minutes ago with God. Since a day with him is as a thousand years. What we want to do is go back to solid ground. Ellen White suggested the devil will put us in retreat. And when you are retreating, there ought to be a point past which you will not retreat. There ought to be something where you plant your feet and stand. And when you do that, you ought to be on solid ground. And I want to make my point clear because once I talked sort of this way and was misunderstood, I want to make it clear, Dr. Martin Luther did not disparage the rough fisherman Peter who was unlettered. He rather became Peter's articulator. Dr. Philip Melanchthon 
highly literate professor in Germany did not embarrass his unlettered friend John. Rather, he affirmed him. And faith, not intellectualism, not scholasticism, but faith in what God says is how we live. Faith in the word, faith in Christ, faith in his promises, faith in the prophecies, faith in his church, and faith in leadership elected by delegates. Not those who are appointed. Charles Dudley used to say, whoever is appointed can be disappointed. <laughs> but God has a system. I believe God wants to do something now for his special people. And it's God's joy to give gifts. And he wants to give the Holy Spirit in full measure. Not so we can just go to work, come home, eat, watch television, and go to sleep. But so that there can be a finished work. The Bible speaks of the early and the latter rain. Palestine had an agricultural society. The early rain caused germination and growth. But the latter rain brought the fruit to full maturity ripened it, ready for the harvest. And Matthew says, the harvest is the end of the world. No equivocating, he knew what it was. And so we must embrace these truths. And I do so with a confidence. Let me tell you one reason. I travel a lot still, even though I'm retired. And everywhere I go, it seems, somebody will come up and say, Pastor, I'm in the church because of your tapes. Do you know when those tapes were made? 1979. Truth doesn't get old. All you got to do is fix it up, modernize it a little bit. But truth itself does not get old. And it is exciting to me. And I know it's dependable. So I, we get back to the old truths with a critical help of new light, which the latter rain reveals. And we must believe with all our hearts as disciples did in the upper room when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Prayer, getting right, casting down ungodly ambition in one place on one accord. Why not pour out the Holy Spirit? God wants to do it. God is eager to do it. Now, those disciples had had their great disappointment. We are still embarrassed about that little part of our history. And I had one say to me, I'm tired of religious hoping. Huh? That's all we got. Let's go back to the road to Emmaus. Some say Emmaus. You got these disciples, their feet dragging their chins dragging, they were utterly cast down, so much so that when they were joined by Christ himself, they didn't recognize him. And when he inquired as to why they were so low, one of them said, we thought. We, we looked toward this fellow Jesus, we thought. He would be our deliverer, we thought. And Christ continued reasoning with him, and they didn't think differently until he raised his hands in blessing over the food and they recognized him. These weary men who were dragging along suddenly took off running. Hallelujah. And I want to tell you, Jerusalem was uphill from wherever they were. They not only ran, they ran uphill. Got some good news now. But the point is, the disciples had been through the great disappointment. October 22, 1844, the sun was westerning. The shadows were bending long toward the east. One poet wrote these words, the sun had cut itself on a sharp hill and was bleeding across the valley. 11 p.m., Lord have mercy. 11.15 p.m., more prayer. The crops are in the field in New England. The property was sold. Certain goodbyes were said to some, 11.30 p.m. I cannot portray the nervousness they must have felt, not in words, the anxiety. Their hearts were beating faster. Perspiration had formed on their brows. Their eyes were widened, and all heads were turned toward the eastern sky, 11.49 p.m. 
Some must have asked, I wonder, questioning their faith now, will it happen? Could that great preacher William Miller be wrong? What shall we do? How shall we face the people? I read somewhere as many as 500,000 could have been listed amongst believers, whether they were strong believers or not. 1157, Lord have mercy. Just three minutes left. 1159, check your watches, everybody. Keep looking up. 12 a.m. from the village steeple, adding to the mockery they soon must face. Loud bongs, 12 of them in a row, pronouncing the beginning of a miserable space of utter embarrassment and castigation. And the unbelievers sighed a sigh of relief and the hangers-on in the movement did the same. The cries of the people, no, 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 we've made a mistake. Can we ever trust God again? Maybe I ought to tell you these were not Seventh-day Adventists. These were just Adventists. Wonderful people. But some of them thought never again. In short order, the 500,000 dwindled down to perhaps 5,000 or less. Ellen White says it was necessary in order to bring the real ones to revival and reformation for the shaking time had taken place. The word of God, the remnant and the spirit of prophecy are inextricably bound together. We cannot deny that. October 23, Hiram Edson got it all straightened out walking in a cornfield. I'm answering those who say Ellen White invented the idea and she wrote and she said, and no, 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 she had her first vision in December. But the very next day, Hiram received the truth. I exclaim, oh, how God loves us. The shaking time did happen. The small group emerged. The hangers-on were dislodged. The wheat and the tares had been sifted and separated. And yet, not yet, not yet. Let me tell you something that maybe you hadn't thought about. In 1844, my people, black people, were slaves. You're not going anywhere without us. <laughs> and so, and so, God said to the prophet John, after the bittersweet experience, thou must prophesy again. You got to come back one more time. This message will go to every kindred tongue and people, and one take says tribe. I know that includes us. Got to do it. The work will not be finished anywhere till it's finished everywhere. And we got to rid self of every man-made dogma, ordinance, tenet, especially the man-made Sabbath. It's got to go. And we've got to give ourselves to agonizing in prayer. Eleanor wrote a song. It's the failure is not with God, it's with me. We've got to keep on praying. On the Sunday following the great disappointment of 1844, from a thousand pulpits, laughter and scorn and mockery and a perverted howl encircled the entire world. Still, a few were in meetings pleading with God in bonds, in houses, and in forests, and in the open fields. They were pleading with God. You don't make mistakes. We did. And now we are acquainted with your discipline. You have separated the superfluous. God is not hard. He endured that with them. The spirit of prophecy said it had to take place. And a final shaking of this church has got to take place. Hard but necessary. But I'm glad to tell you today, the Lord hears prayer. Back then, these people, this little group, came to a conclusion, Lord, we were wrong. You are right. Tell us what you want us to do, and we will do anything. And when they impressed even the Lord with that, please forgive the imagery of the black preacher. I can almost hear God say, anything? Yes, Lord, anything. All right, you're mine. Anything means keeping all of my commandments. Not nine, all of them. 
and becoming reformers in the way you look, the way you talk, the way you walk, the way you entertain yourselves. And I'm going to give you a name which carries the two distinguishing features of our faith up front, Seventh-day Adventists. And meetings are happening now across this nation. People are changing the names of their churches and taking out Seventh-day Adventists. You, my sister-in-law asked one lady, a good woman, why we don't want to turn people off? This presumes that what we're trying to do is a purely human-to-human -human encounter. Let me tell you, in case you haven't thought about it, there's another being involved. His name is the Holy Ghost. He takes care of the ethos. We better learn before it's too late. In 1940, I was 10 years old. I went to a church where I heard a man preach with his Bible that the end is near. We sang songs I'd never heard in the Methodist church. It's almost time for the Lord to come. I hear the people say, we know not the hour of the Master's appearing. Nearer than when we first believed. So God's got a job to get us ready. Revival and Reformation, the way to do it. God has a job on his hand. He's not going to throw this church away easily. He's going to save. And some of the folk we thought wouldn't make it are going to make it. And some that we thought were ready to sprout halos are not going to show up in the kingdom. Three great surprises. The first one is that you are there. Second one is that folk you thought wouldn't be there, and they are. And the third one, obvious. But God has to get us ready for that great day. Ready to keep company with perfect beings. Ready to walk and talk with sinless beings on a billion worlds. And he can do it. But we got to ask. And we got to be sincere. And we got to back off our pre-opinionated ideas and listen to the Holy Spirit. And the early and latter rain will do its work. And when it happens, it will show on the outside. Immodesty, which is persistent and unnecessary, will cease. These incredible worship patterns will dissipate. Evolution growing as a tear amongst us will be done amongst us. Righteousness by works insults Jesus. Righteousness by faith deliberately distorted. The latter rain will settle it all and the sealing will happen. And Ellen White says the sealing is simply a settling into the truth. Some folk walking around waiting for figures to appear on their forehead. Yeah. It's got to be inside your forehead. Righteousness by faith. Harvest time. The Lord is going to do his work. We must have the former rain before the latter rain can do its work. And we got to agonize. And I'm talking about me when I say that. One last point. There will be a return to primitive godliness. You know what primitive means. The, the first, the premier, a return to primitive godliness, not something to theologize about. In plain language, we've got to be like that early church upon whom, upon which God bestowed the Holy Ghost. In the book Evangelism 701, we've got to be purified of every defilement. Spiritual Gifts, volume 2, page 226 it will prepare us for translation. These are solemn words, and I know it. Thousands will leave and become our bitterest enemies, but this by inspiration, when they leave, and I guess it can't happen until they leave, but when they leave, other thousands will come in. And listen to these words. The ranks of the Lord's army will not be diminished. Somebody ought to say Amen to that. That's what we've got to look forward to. Satan will come forward knowing it's the final hour with lying wonders. At that time, 
great controversy 612 says, miracles will be wrought, a counter work, and people will be impressed. The harvest will be ripened, and God's people will be ready to go home. Please let me say this as fast as I can. That was a story that really took me out of my chair. A young man and a young woman, and I believe the story said he was a pastor. They had a beautiful five-year-old daughter, and they lost her. Now, just imagine the grief. I can't go into detail with that. Imagine how torn up this family was. And one day, while the husband was out and the wife was home by herself, something happened. My mama taught me a whole lot of things before I was four years old. Amongst them, the five senses, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, and I missed one, didn't I? And, 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 and this woman was at home doing chores when all of a sudden she heard, now I'm going to point, you get the point. She heard the voice of a little girl, Mommy, Mommy, what? And then, to her surprise, around the corner came her little daughter with her arms out, seeing, hearing, seeing. When she scooped her up in her arms, she smelled the fresh smell of a freshly washed child, smelling. When she planted a kiss, a kiss on her face, she tasted, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, seeing, all five senses said, this is your daughter. All five senses, all five senses. But there was something that came now. God comes now. And she dropped on her knees and she said, Lord, I don't understand this. But the Bible says the dead know not anything. The Bible says their love and their hatred are now perished. The Bible says they return no more to their houses. I don't know what this is, but whatever it is, I'm asking you to rid this home of this apparition and rid my burden of grief and it was so. And did we get so smart that everything depended on our senses when sometimes we don't make sense. Thank you, Pastor Brooks, for that powerful sermon that you've just shared with us. And thank you for sharing in this program on Revival and Reformation. We want to take a few moments after the presentation of Pastor Brooks to discuss a little bit with him the message and the practical application of this. And I invite you to join us now as we discuss a little bit more about this. Pastor, earlier in the very introduction to this program, you mentioned that in the concept of revival and reformation, that revival is a change of mind, reformation is a change of ways, or a change of how we live. Yes. Uh, unpack that very briefly for us, please. The truth is, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. There are hundreds of thousands of people all around the world who want to do God's will, and yet this personal experience which they must have in order to do God's will hasn't become a reality in their lives. Okay. Revival is necessary. The great moments for the church have always followed revival. Okay. And revival comes as a result of men and women going to God in prayer. So we want to get into a process that ultimately leads into full obedience to God and preparation for His kingdom. Pastor Brooks, you, you made a very perceptive comment that there's millions of people around the world who want to do and follow God's will, but well-intentioned though they be, they are not really in relationship with God. Now, how does a person have that genuine relationship so that whatever they do is right, rather than just going through formality? How do we get it spiritually right? I'd like to answer by saying that it has to be personal. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Okay. People want to know God's will. They stagger at what they call the responsibility of being a Christian. But if we get the process and put priorities in our thinking, 
Uh, revival prepares us for reformation, mm -hmm. and rain gives us the power to be reformed. It's not difficult, and it's not complicated. So coming back now to the individual, here's a person who sincerely wants to do the will of God. And I get up in the morning, what's my next step? Prayer. Okay, prayer. Now let me ask you personally, uh, you've been in ministry for 50 years. Yes. How much time do you take for prayer, if I could be so bold as to ask you that question? Well, this business of prayer, you know, the Lord said pray without ceasing. Right. And they are formal prayers and they are morning and evening devotions. Yes. But a Christian learns to pray all day long. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that you stop everything and sit down and pray all day long. It doesn't mean that at all. But it means your mind is knit to heaven. Your meditations are uh, influenced by the Holy Spirit. And you and God have a conversation at any time. I remember once uh, someone telling me in order to be, be heard, you had to be on your knees and so forth. One of the greatest prayers I ever prayed, I was behind the wheel of a car that was out of control on an icy hill. <laughs> and God heard that prayer. I didn't even close my eyes. <laughs> it's a wise thing you didn't. <laughs> so praying without ceasing, the heart is knit with God. Now, uh, that's that's an extremely practical thing. In other words, when you get out of not even when you get out of bed, you're th even before you get out of bed, throughout the day, you're yes. in communion with heaven. I had the opportunity to, to address some young people one day, and we were trying to be very practical. And I talked about the first thing we're told by the pen of inspiration: begin the day with God. Begin. Yes. Now, if you really take that literally, that ought to be the first thing you do when you wake up. Uh -huh. You can start by just thanking God that you did wake up. Yeah, yeah. But I pointed out that if you take time to shave and groom yourself, you're already entering into temptation uh, too early before prayer. Uh, <laughs> while you're shaving, the radio is on and there's the wrong music, yeah. the wrong ideas, the wrong thoughts. Begin the day with the Lord. This kind of discipline shapes the life and reformation will surely follow, which is a change of ways. We're going to talk about reformation in a moment. Now, we're, we've been talking about revival, reformation, and reign with Pastor C.D. Brooks. We're going to take a short break. We're going to be right back, and we're going to talk about reformation and reign. The mission statement of the Seventh Adventist Church is to make disciples, communicating with them the everlasting gospel in the context of the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. To be a disciple is to, to give honor and glory to our God, to worship him who, who made heaven and earth. To be a disciple is to be renewed, to be revived. You see, the word revived means to, to live again, and in Christ Jesus, our Lord, we indeed live again. We are born again. We are revived. And so it is, it is perfectly obvious and natural that as a church, we are to be involved in revival, to bringing new life and hope, to training people to be disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is our work. Join the World Seventh-day Adventist Church in starting the new year right. Jesus is coming soon, and before He returns, the Holy Spirit will be poured out in a powerful way. Revival and reformation are necessary to receive the Holy Spirit. Start this new year right by taking special time to pray. Ask God to spiritually revive you and your family and lead you even closer to Jesus this coming new year. Thank you for being with us. We've been talking about revival and reformation in this series of programs every day. My guest today is Pastor C.D. Brooks. We were talking a moment ago about the experience of revival, and now we want to talk a little bit about reformation. You mentioned earlier revival is a change of heart. Reformation is a change of ways. What would you say characterizes a godly lifestyle? I read this from a dictionary. Okay. It said a Christian is one 
who does as Christ did, thinks as Christ thought, loves as Christ loves. In other words, we have to be like Jesus. Uh -huh. Many people are discouraged in their quest for eternal life, not because of Christianity itself, but because they don't see examples. We need not only revival, which prepares us to be examples, but we need changes in our lives, in our lifestyles, in what we do, where we go, how we think. These things take place under the aegis of the Holy Spirit. And when they take place, we become then true witnesses for Jesus and folk who are watching us, not only old folk, but young ones. They see a difference. Mm -hmm. This is what Reformation brings about. So what I hear you saying then is that we need to be studying the life of Jesus, yes. praying that God will apply that to our practical life, right. and then making value decisions based on what God has taught us? What God has taught us. Yeah. Now, our messages, Pastor, are going around the world. This isn't just a North American series. This is a program that is being broadcast globally. So there's a huge variety in cultures, different languages. And so uh, naturally, cultural expressions vary significantly. Are we looking as Christians in a reformed godly Christian lifestyle for uniformity? Are we looking for everybody to be walking lockstep <laughs> the same way? Uh, help us to understand the practical cultural applications. If you were living in the middle of, of Africa or India or Central Asia, and uh, how would it apply there? In a special sense, we could say that Christianity itself is a culture. There are changes that take place no matter where you are in the world, no matter what the customs have been. There are changes that take place when you become acquainted with Jesus and you read his word and you study his life and desire to be like him. Uh -huh. Then there are changes that take place. We are not a monolithic people, however. I mentioned earlier that it's all personal. And uh, some of the things that will impress one group will not impress another. But when we are faithful in emulating and following the example of our Savior, studying his word, understanding it, and being willing to do it, then the Holy Spirit translates that into something that all cultures can appreciate. Pastor Brooks, I want to thank you for the powerful sermon that you preached today, I want to thank you for the opportunity to discuss a little bit of how this applies to our, our hearts and lives. Thank it's you for being with It's a privilege to be with you, Brad. Yes. Now, uh, as, we, uh, as we think again about the whole experience of a deeper, more meaningful relationship with God, go to revivalandreformation.org and you can get a lot more information there. Remember, at the same time tomorrow, we're going to be having a continuation of the same series of programs. You're going to be richly blessed with that. And we just want to invite you in a very special way to have that deep relationship with God. And remember, our God is the God of hope.